Ladies and gentlemen, transmitting direct from Lion's Den Studios in Los Angeles, California, Crew S Studios and Danube Productions bring you The Conduit. Bringing together motivated artists to share their experience and to pull back the curtain for a first-hand look at a life in the arts. On this episode, our guest is music producer and ace DJ, DJ Newmark from globe-trotting hip-hop giants Jurassic 5. So adjust your antenna, relax, and tune in. The program is about to begin. All right. Welcome, everybody, to episode five of The Conduit, a podcast where I sit down and talk to amazing, courageous people about making a living in the arts. Today, my guest is DJ Newmark, known primarily, along with Cut Chemist, as the DJ producers behind Los Angeles hip-hop legends Jurassic 5. However, in addition to J5, Uncle New, as he's called, has gone on to produce tracks for Method Man from Wu-Tang Clan, Slim Kid Trey from The Far Side, Aloe Black, Charles Bradley, Hilltop Hoods, and many others, in addition to helping score music for film, like The Green Zone with Matt Damon, Hollywood Homicide with Harrison Ford, and Ride Along 1 and 2 with Ice Cube and Kevin Hart. Newmark's now legendary Zodiac track series has blown minds since its debut and landed him the role of house DJ on TBS's Drop the Mic show, which in turn led to the release of his single Zodiac Killa, featuring Method Man that yours truly got to play on. But wait, that's not all. Never satisfied, always learning, and never resting on his laurels, Newmark started releasing his own Crate Expectations sample packs, followed by the release of his Creme de la Crate pack for Ableton, giving up-and-coming producers top-notch sounds to work with. Above all, though, DJ Newmark is a testament to the fact that a solid work ethic, good ears, and people skills can afford you a life surrounded by music and talented people. So sit back, relax, and enjoy my conversation with the one they call DJ Newmark. DJ Newmark, welcome to The Conduit, man. Man, it's so good to be here with you, Dan. Thank you for taking the time and being here, man. Yeah, the pleasure's mine. Thank you for having me. Thanks, man. Well, so I kind of start with everybody. Uh, You're, I found out, just about two months older than me, born in 71. You just had your birthday a little bit ago. I am. I just want to kind of talk about the influence in your house growing up and music you heard, brothers or sisters, what your mom and dad were listening to, all that kind of good stuff. How was, uh, how did DJ Newmark's musical tastes develop in the household? In the house, there wasn't a whole lot. My mom okay. uh, had her Persian records, you know, nice. not that that's not a whole lot. It just was very different from what was happening in the in the States and what was happening around me and at school and, you know, what kids were listening to. So yeah. she, she would be like in the living room listening to her belly dance music and Iranian, uh, Turkish, Ooh, um, yeah. a lot of Arabic music, a lot of Arabic music. Um, nice. That's good. And so that was playing in the background, but I hadn't developed a taste for that, nor did I have a taste for Persian food at that age. <laughs> oh, yeah. I'm talking at a young age here. I mean, later on, I went, crazy over the both the music the food the whole everything but uh, you know young you're like wait what is you know yeah that said um my father was very much into you know classic 50s rock and roll you know that kind of thing yeah and so i didn't get a whole lot of musical influence at home it was in elementary school and in junior high where everything just happened yeah. for me and, and it was uh thanks to a very good friend of mine by the name of chris cook who was uh he played bass okay in my uh junior high band class oh cool and i played drums in the junior high band class and he was like yo are you up on you know utfo are you up on like all these <laughs> hip-hop groups that he, he was listing off and i'm like man i was like mimicking like like Led Zeppelin breaks in my you know bedroom at the time. I wasn't really hip to to hip hop in uh, yeah. at that age. Uh, I think I was eighty. Fuck, that was uh, I forgot. I, I want to say eighty five. You know, yeah. I, I heard things, but you know, I heard rappers delight. I heard things around the block, but it hadn't like hit me. Hit me until my best friend, right? That, right. He was my musical influence, and he brought me in. Oh man, so that's cool. It didn't happen at, at at the house. It happened at school. Right. <laughs> Similar for me too. Yes. 
Wow, that's cool. That's really cool. Yeah. Um, so what were like the first uh, artists you heard that were just like, holy crap, like I want to start doing something like that? Were there specific ones you could, you could remember? Where I was like, I want to do music. I want to sound like that or I want to. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, I think the the very first group was UTFO because Mixmaster Ice was, you know, he was, well, he was the ninja on the turntables. He was incredible. Yeah. And it was the first concert. My, no, it was my second concert my mother ever, you know, took me to. She drove me and my boy, Chris Cook, that I just was telling you about, yeah. all the way to Anaheim to see UTFO, Sir mix a lot Egyptian Lover, and uh, there was another <laughs> nice. act. I'm just not coming to me right now. And I was like, you know, me and Chris talk about it all the time now, like, wow, how, how sweet was she to bring us there when I was 13? That's great. So, uh, seeing live performance on turntables you know through yeah. Mixmaster eyes and seeing the mcs do what they do you know kangle kid and emd yeah. and you know all, all those guys i was just like what like you know because before that like as a little boy i was like i want to be in a rock group you know yeah. i want to be in a funky group of some sort you know like as a yeah. drummer as a drummer yeah. like i always wanted to be in the back behind my hat you know hiding and um <laughs> once i got introduced to to turntables through Chris again, uh, yeah. cause his uncle was a DJ that would come back and forth from, uh, LA to, uh, from New York to LA. Okay. Uh, once I saw him on turntables, I was like, wow, can I do this? It was like, it is, it, this is possible. Like, so it just, um, yeah. after that it was house parties and, and then it just became a little bit more realistic for me, you know? Dang, man. So was UTFO the first time you'd actually seen someone rocking doubles and using turntables? Like live. aside from hearing it on records and stuff, live, yes. Like at yeah. a concert, yes. And I had seen other clips of things and heard okay. a lot of records. I started buying records pretty early, you know, thirteen years yeah. old, you know, twelve, thirteen. I forgot what year that was, but um, yeah. So I was buying a lot. So, but you know, at that time, you know, obviously there was no internet, and it was just such a weird era. We would get, I feel like, songs about two months or three months later than new york so like everything was kind of late here in la so we were always yeah. playing catch up you know right so uh i would buy <laughs> i was one of those guys that would buy like the whole catalog in in yeah. uh, a record label so select records <laughs> was utfo's label so i'd buy all the select records whistle yeah. and all the other groups and so it was just one of those things i was, I was like you know, I think one of my friends came over and was like, uh, you have anything else in here besides this catalog? And I'm like, yeah, you're probably right. I'd probably sure should buy some run DMC and some other shit at this point. But you're, you're a completist um, and in our, in our circle, there's so. a few of those. <laughs> I guess so. I'm not a completist now. I just fill holes in my collection that I like, but I mean, yeah, it was just, you know, being naive and young and, and trying to discover things and sure. find the, the nook that made me happy, you know, in hip hop. So. David. Wow. So you were buying records that early. That's incredible. Yeah. I, re I remember buying some, but it was like Kiss Alive maybe. And like, I think The Clash, you know, when they did Combat Rock and all that, that came nice. out. I remember yeah. buying that, but those were Stray Cats. Those were a couple of my first ones. Stray Cats. Wow. Man. What were, what were the first ones that kind of made huge impacts on you that you bought with your own money? Record you bought? Do you remember? Um, well, uh, UTFO, Roxanne, Roxanne, that whole album. Yep. Yeah. Um, uh, Spoonie G, Spoon and Rap. Yeah. Um, uh, ba -ba 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 -ba. Um, uh, Fat Back Band. Oh, I, yeah. I caught, because I heard, you know, and of course, Rapper's Delight. I heard Rapper's Delight, and everyone was saying, well, Fat Back Band was actually the OG OG. And I was like, come on, man. That's like a, <laughs> you know, funky group from the seventies, you know, this is before I had appreciation for that and realized that there was so much being taken from the seventies. So, uh, you know, sure. naive, I'm like, what, I don't know, 14, 15, I don't know, probably 14 at this stage. Yeah. And so I, I went back and I was like, Oh shit, this is probably the first rap, you know? So that it was, right. it was a contender for the first rap, but, and I think it might still be considered the first rap. Um, yeah. Yeah. King James. Um, so yeah, those are the first ones I really remember. And then I, I ventured out into like, you know, Lisa, Lisa and the cold jam and things that were happening locally in LA, you know, right. That was like sure. very much, um, you know, house party driven songs at that time, you know, the expose shit and all, all that craziness just just to see right. what it was doing. And I, and I actually got really into the uptempo stuff. And when Miami bass came around, I actually got really into it because of the sheer, um, 
I think the, the power of it and, the, and the, really the sonics of it, that's really what I'm trying to say. The way they EQ'd mm-hmm. it, you know, 808 yeah. was very prevalent. And that was, you know, as we know, very, um, it knocked the hardest. I guess it's still knocking the hardest today, right? Shit. Um, so it just kind of threw me off. Like, yo, what is this drum machine? And then, you know, actually to, t- to rewind a little bit, I bought my first drum machine. I yeah. bought a drum machine before I bought turntables. Okay, yeah, so I was, I was ask programming. You about that. Yeah, I was programming a, a Roland uh, 606 in my band class class with my boy uh, Chris. Like when you know the you know orchestra conductor was working on horns or something, I would have my headphones on, playing yeah. with that little drum machine, like trying to figure out what I heard on K Day. You know, like, right. like what, what is this? Like what what are these chains? What are what are these sequences? Like I didn't understand sure. how it was changing every fourth bar. I didn't get it, so I was. And then the sounds were just fucking me up. And I couldn't find the 808. I didn't know it was called an 808. So yeah. I started there first. And then I got some beat up servo turntables, belt drives that were like <laughs> yeah. a great way to learn. I mean, because they were fucking almost impossible to mix on at some point. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Dang, man. Well, yeah, I was going to ask you about that because you've always been like someone who you, I mean, whenever I'd see you with J5, you always had some crazy shit wired up. So I was like, your your interest in kind of finding out how things work and building your own stuff seems to have started pretty early. Yeah, I you know, it was, it was from fantasizing, really, because uh, I always thought, being naive and really young, that they were playing the drum machine live. I didn't realize it was, like, mm. sequencing. Right. <laughs> right <laughs> Until right. I got that drum machine and really started to figure it out. I'm like, oh, duh. Like, so I, I was, but so then it made me think, you know, I, I remember saying to my friends really young, like, wouldn't it be cool if they were like just playing the drum machine? Like, because yeah. I was a drummer, so I'm thinking like that, sure. right? So I was like, wouldn't yeah. it be cool if like, you know, the r- rappers were, you know, MCs were rhyming their parts and the guy in the back was actually playing the drum machine and maybe yeah. there was another guy on turntables? Like, that would be cool. And yeah. they're like, yeah, you think too much new and, you know. <laughs> and basketball you know basketball players and whatever like they weren't really into music you know they were just they, they liked hip-hop but you know right for me it was like whoa you know like my mind was blown I, and i'm still have that that um childlike you know uh How playfulness this happen yeah yeah i i think that's what keeps me creative is the 13 year old that still lives in me and um it, right. the, the sense of wonderment is is what keeps me alive in this business yeah man that's beautiful well, were you fixing stuff up in the garage when you were a kid or were you, what were your other projects before you got into drum machines and turntables? Were you, were you kind of inquisitive with how things worked before, before that? I, I wish I could say yes. I really wasn't. I'm, I'm, I'm yeah. not handy at all, which still irks me to this day. It's like, you know, that, that surprises me. Thing of, be a, a thing of being a man, like I want to fix things and I always, and I always try, <laughs> don't get me wrong. I yeah. give it the college try, Dan, yeah. but I always seem to botch it up in some way because I get impatient or I'm thinking about fucking music. So like my, my mind is always distracted and I hear things. And so I have a hard time focusing on one small thing. I was like, oh, we got to fix the kitchen cabinet drawer or whatever. So I get distracted because I'm hearing melodies and ideas in my head all the time. So I, I lose my patience is what I'm, what I'm getting at. <laughs> <Yeah>. um, <laughs> but no, I, but I was always like pulling pots and pans down and hitting them. And my mom would be like, shut the fuck up enough with this, you know, or I remember countless <laughs> yeah. times the teacher, like, I, you remember the little milk cartons they used to give us at school? They're like the yeah. little joints, you know, the, yep. like the quarter. You yeah, know. totally. To- I orange juice setting, came in those too. Yeah. I remember like, you know, I set up like four of those and we're using them as toms like on my <laughs> desk. And the, the teacher's like, are you fucking kidding me right now? You know, like I remember one teacher always like, come on, man, like enough, like enough with the tapping. I was always like, tapping yeah. on the desk and just it just lived in me and I, I just had to get it out in some way i always think it would be funny if like all of us who were doing that back then because i was definitely tapping on shit and driving teachers crazy uh, yeah we're all in the same classroom oh god yeah <laughs> it would have just their heads would have exploded it would have made a great group <laughs> <laughs> oh my god well you were talking about how seeing utfo was the first time you saw um a dj really do his thing live i'm wondering back in the day obviously we grew up pre-youtube and being able to find whatever footage of anything you want at the you know click of youtube but uh did you go about finding like vhs tapes of footage of groups or where were you yeah. where were you watching this stuff you yeah, had friends that uh, were collectors your buddy was a collector of that stuff too yeah, you know, for a long time, it was like Beat Street was the movie, right? You know, Breaking right. came out and I was 
annoyed at breaking. I, I, I didn't think it was a true depiction of hip hop. And I guess maybe yeah. it was in some sorts in L.A., but I saw way iller shit in L.A. Shit, yeah. even being in the Valley, you, being at the UA <laughs> Theater as a kid, there used, used to be a, you know, that's like on, you know, in North Hollywood, there would be tons of kids that would flock there in 84, 85, something like that. And yeah. I would see ridiculous breakers, you know. Yeah. And I, then breaking came out and I was like, this is what they're doing at Venice Beach, really? It's like it, it just didn't <laughs> seem right. Like it's, I'm like, how's the valley iller than Venice? There's that that can't be, you know. Right. So I realized, you know, Hollywood uh played its part in that. And sure. um once breaking came out, I was like, oh shit. And then I kind of backtracked. I was taping all those on VHS. I would, you know, when they would come right. on, I would, I would have tapes of them. Yeah. And then someone kept telling me about Wildstyle. Wildstyle, one of my boys that lived in New York and moved to um, L.A. Uh, to go to school where I went to school. And uh, mm. he was like, yo, man, aren't you up on Wildstyle? I'm like, what the fuck is that? And he was telling me that. And then the Grandmaster Flash scene, I was like, oh, yeah. God. Like <laughs> all the pieces kind of came together. And I realized how much I had to go back, how much I missed in those like, eight, nine years or whatever I missed. Right. You know, because it you got to think like... 85 86 87 you know th those er that era was the birth of so many different things or at least yeah. it's when uh, those different genres came into fruition right. you know it, it, we had new wave music that was brand new you know beatboxing was new break dancing was new rapping was yeah. new djing was new what the fuck is a mixer you know yeah. like everything was brand new and so it was super exciting for a young nerd like myself i was like oh my right. god come on man so <laughs> i i I I was part of the the pinnacle of it, I guess, or the the part of the like it's here, it's now, you know. Um, it sure. was starting to become a lot of commercialized. Stuff was happening yeah. when we were in junior high. Yeah, yeah it was yeah. starting to be commercialized. So I was like, God, well, what of what were the roots like? And then when they would say play yeah. some old school, by the time eighty eight hit, when I was starting to do house parties, yeah, they would play some old school. I was like, Yeah, cool, because I was. I w made sure I went back and collected as much as I could or as much as I yeah. could find out about. I would go to Jersey every year oh, from yeah. like 80, oh God, from like 85 till 89. I went to Jersey Dang. every year because that's where my cousins lived. And so I'd be oh, like, okay. we got to go to this record store. We got to try this. We got to go <laughs> into the city. I would be like that annoying cousin <laughs> yeah because um, we just didn't got get some it records here. yeah i got some heat got some heat <laughs> that's crazy do you remember the record stores and which ones you used to go to out here no, too i i don't remember the stores because they were random and i didn't have any friends no. that knew what was up out there and my cousins were yeah. so not into hip-hop so oh, okay. um and i was like i want to see some good graph and i want to i want to go to a music store so i mean they were like just generic stores but it was way better than what was happening in la got you, uh, got you. so i took what i could get Dang, man. Well, so how did you first start kind of figuring out how to do what they do on Turtles? How did you figure out about, you know, rocking doubles and mixing and beat matching and everything? Like, what? who did you look to? How did you kind of get your bearings, you know, before you started, just as you were building your skills? Yeah. Were there particular um, people you looked to or how did you figure it out? There was a, you know, a series of different things that happened, like Grandmaster T DST, you know. Yeah on his on the award show you know i was like okay well that's cool i, I watched it but before then i was listening yeah. and i was constantly picking up the needle and going did he move like the volume off on that part like and so for me i i learned through audio like uh, anytime there was a teacher like doing a speech i would kind of tune out mm. so i would have to you know um i'm sorry not not the teachers doing a speech anytime i had to read something Oh, okay. I would you. tune out when a teacher do it, did a speech. I would tune in. Got um, you. I had that backwards. Uh, so yeah, I would have to listen to it on record more than anything else. Uh, yeah. Actually, sometimes seeing the visual shows or the visual uh, 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 demonstrations confused me a little bit. It, it okay. was listening to it where I understood that a chirp scratches when you take the fader out just right before it goes you know forward or whatever yeah. you know yeah. uh so it i could hear it like on jazzy jeff mm. cutting on on the jazzy jeff and the fresh prince album I, I can hear things i can hear mixmaster ice doing certain things with the awe sound from the, you know 
uh, Fat Five Freddy record or whatever. Um, I I could pick it up easier there. And doubles, I just understood the first time I heard, heard it. I was like, oh, cool, yeah. they're taking it back to the one. And right. I knew the one from playing drums. So that was that came right. easy to me. And I'm surprisingly not huge on doubles. I should really be great at doubles, and I just am not. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> or at least I don't <laughs> take enough time and practice it, I guess. Um, but I, it was marking the records that I didn't understand, you know. Like, oh, oh yeah. and then the, the visual of that helped. And um, I think seeing that um, on the early DMC battles... Mm -hmm. uh you know cash money and steve d who was like the first person i saw really beat juggle that that's when i was like oh they're marking the fucking records aladdin i saw his markers really clean i'm like oh they're bringing it to 12 o'clock or they're bringing it to three o'clock like every time so yeah um yeah that's crazy man that's crazy wow well uh Incredible. So talk about, talk to me about, uh, as you were getting your, your skills were improving and, uh, you were getting asked to play parties and all that. Where were some of those? Talk to me about, uh, kind of figuring out how performing worked and what to do with a live performance when you had the stage. Yeah. Um, I kind of transferred what I learned from drumming in in junior high. I used to get into drum battles in junior high. Okay. Um, and so I remember like how to interact with the crowd kind of, uh, in that yeah. battle, you know, eye contact and, uh, ah, yeah. Cert- so where move- were you, where were you doing that school? The school had like talent shows and stuff and they put yeah. you against other drummers. I was, there was two drummers, two of us as drummers in the jazz band and, you oh, know, wow. te- teachers being politically correct. Well, we, we, well, you guys, you guys could both be drummers, you know? And <laughs> yeah. we would be, I'd be like, I'm better than him. He's better than me. And then it was a huge kid too. Like he was like, I was always really scrawny. I was always the smallest kid in my class. So he was like huge over his drum set. And I could barely, you could barely see my eyes, you know, under the Tom Toms, <laughs> you know? So I was like Kermit the Frog. And so we always had drum, <laughs> drum battles and like, you know, the auditorium and all the school would watch him like, no, wow. you got him, you know? <laughs> oh, wow. That's crazy. But, so it's where was this? From, what school was this? Where were you went go to, to Madison, junior high? I went, I went to Madison Junior High okay. in, uh, in the Valley, yeah. Yeah, okay. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, so, I mean, to start from that, and then I started doing all the house parties, and, and just, um, I had a day job at Carvel Ice Cream and did house parties on the weekend. and made more doing house parties than I did at Carvel. Dang. And would do everything from weddings to a lot of, like, backyard parties and, you know, parties where the, they had the jungle juice and people in your face, like, play toddy t you know and play king t play you know all the west coast shit it was like uh, a lot of gangsters too uh trying to prove themselves because it was the valley so it was like they Mm. had more to say i remember one time our dj coffin got shot up not purposefully because there was a shootout at the party oh no (laughs) and our and our dj setup just happened to be in the way oh so thank god we got you weren't in the way Yeah, yeah word uh so you know those are some of the early experiences, you know, but what I love about that era, I, I, I wouldn't trade it for anything because it taught me how to take requests. Right. And, you know, you see a lot right now online about DJs like, I don't take requests, fuck requests. I'm not your jukebox, yada, yada, yada. And like, yeah. I look at it now and I'm like, wow, that's what a brave new world, you know, how yeah. convenient <laughs> that you could say you don't want to request. Because I remember like I growing up, I had to take them at a house party with a gangster standing over you with a 40. <laughs> You're right. taking the fucking request, you're request, you know, you're, yeah. you're going to play paid dues, you know, you're going to play yeah. these songs, you know. And so it was really good um, uh, training wheels for me because I needed to learn very quickly what crates to bring. And you know, I always had about seven to eight crates with me or me and my crew, I should say. Yeah. And it learned it taught me how to access those records quickly, how to thumb through them quickly and know where everything was. Yeah. Um, so my organization skills became paramount. At, at a very early age yeah, and, and it, it taught me how to weave in the song no matter what BPM I was sitting at. So I had to find a conduit, a way to get from 90 BPM to the request, which was at 110. Right. Um, and, and still move the party, still keep the ladies on the floor, you know, mm-hmm. cause they were the, the, the life of the yep. party. Every time they were the, the, the girls are line. dancing <laughs> and the dudes are dancing. Absolutely. G yeah. absolutely. So it was one of those things that, I learned about finesse. I learned about uh, the psychology of DJing. Yeah. 
Yeah, that's crazy. I mean, that's, uh, you know, I've done like such a minuscule amount of DJing compared to you and some of the dudes we know, but the, the, the request thing is like, it's an interesting thing. Like it can be something where it makes perfect sense. You want to make people happy and you want to have people have a good time, but then you get people who come up to you and like, can you play, you know, yeah. had a few to drink. Can you play this? And I'm like, I just played like three songs by that person. Like, yeah. Or, or it's just, such just an outla- that- yeah. Or it's such an outlandish re- request that it's like, come right. on, like I'm not yeah. going to play, you know, Persian Anthem trance tonight. It's not happening. <laughs> you know, exactly. so it's just like, you know, it, it's gotten crazy. The requesting has gotten crazy. Don't get me wrong. It just was yeah. like a great way for me to get fucking socked in my mouth and learn how to DJ. Like it right. was, it was, it was the way to do it, and especially in a um, backyard or at someone's parents' house when they were out of town in that setting right. where people, it's just like, there's no supervision. Know, everyone, anything oh, could happen. Yeah. Oh, that whole <laughs> shit. When that's happening, you yeah. gotta, you gotta deliver. Totally. Wow. So did you write out the gate after you bought turntables and a mixer? Did you go, go in on a PA? Like that was one of the first things you bought too? or Yeah, that was all part, part of it. So every yeah. every bit of money that I made from DJing, I poured right back into getting speakers with my boys with um, yeah. uh, Amani. You know Amani, DJ Burt Blackrack. So that was like the guy I cut Dang. my teeth with. So yeah. that's how we met, you know, through, through doing that. And it was like three or four other guys with us in the crew. So uh, we'd go to different parties and it's like, okay, we made $250. <laughs> let's get some records or let's, we need a new amp or yeah. amps were always an issue. Um, speakers were always an issue. Uh, his father, I think gave us some, some, uh, um, they weren't, were they Vegas? I want to say they were Sarah and Vegas, but they were the mids to a huge system. So we never had the right mm. amount of bump. So we're always oh. kind of, cha- you know, all the problems you go through. So we, yeah. you know, ground wire problems to the turntables, you know, mixer problems because it's static, <laughs> yeah. not the right amp, not the right speakers, but you, you're learning as you go <laughs> and you get your ass kicked, but you're, oh yeah, it's like the whole time there's some, there's some adverse thing in your face, but the era totally. made it all worth it. The era, um, you know, carrying the crates wasn't easy, all that. You hear people talk about that now a lot, but yeah. it, the era and the excitement and the encouragement from your peers at school made it fucking yeah. unfucking paralleled. Like, yeah. yeah, it's so crazy how I mean, it's obviously it's the same thing performing music, whether you're playing records or if you're playing an, a guitar or whatever. But that excitement is the same, man. And learning how to work with a crowd. Yeah, to exactly. And carrying the shit part is yeah. like uh, the other fun part that we have in common. Yeah, <laughs> like, that's right. Breaking your back when you're 20. <laughs> yeah, I know Dang. about it. Well, so um, you're rocking backyard parties with your DJ crew and um when is kind of what are your first experiences uh, with MCs on the mic? Are people just jumping on at parties, or yeah. when did you first kind of decide to get something together like for real and establish kind of like your own little crew? With yeah. MCs? So, well, I mean, there was always like you know MCs jumping on at the party and yeah. thinking they can rhyme or freestyle, whatever. So that was cool. Right. But you know, the house party thing died out. And as 90, 91 rolled in, I was starting to kind of wanting to branch into like playing clubs in Hollywood because I never played a club. Yeah. And I knew it was a completely different feel. And I, I learned very quickly how, how tough it was. J- just the transition, not how tough it is to rock a club, but the transition from doing a house party to a club is a different feel. Um, mm-hmm. I'd love to do a, like a discussion with some people about this, actually. It'd be kind of fun to see the, the difference of the from old school cats, you know, what that transition transition was like for them but yeah uh, fast forward a little bit in 90 shit i don't know what it's 93 i think um i was djing at this spot called rat race where the promoter john asbell and his band would Mm. invite mcs to rhyme or perform or freestyle uh, in front of his band so like you know live band mcs so that's where i met um uh Cut, well, that's why I met all Jurassic Five, really, but it was two different groups at that time. It was yeah. Rebels Rhythm and Unity Committee, and right. I met Cut specifically at a rehearsal studio um, for that night. And I had a wah wah pedal hooked up to my turntables, and he was like, "Yo, DJ Hendrix," you know. <laughs> so <laughs> yeah. we hit it off right away, obviously. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, so yeah, um, yeah, and then you know uh, we, you know he had a song that he thought that rebels of rhythm, which was I'll kill and soup would yeah. sound good on and meet his group with, which was Mark seven and Charlie tuna. 
Yeah. So it was like two groups formed as one plus me, I guess right. is the best way to explain it. Um, right. And then that was when, you know, rocking with MCs to get to your question kind of became a lot more serious and, and tangible because before that we had all been shopping demos in mid to night. I was with, I learned how to dig through a cat named Brother Soul. Hmm. who had a gang of records and he ended up knowing all of like lucas's cut chemist's samples when he was shopping his demo because he worked at jive yeah <laughs> so he's like oh shit you use the so-and-so so it was like six <laughs> yeah. degrees of separation or whatever so right cut new records brother soul new records and so the transition from my my man brother soul to cut was very easy and it made sense and cut was uh, digging the same way brother soul was hmm. um except he was using he was producing more and gotcha. I was producing a lot at the time and I was, you know, trying to learn like all, like we all were in the early nineties, like, you know, how do we fucking find the so-and-so break? Where's Apache? Where's this, you know, incredible yeah. bongo band, all, all this stuff was happening really quickly and you were trying to find the records and you, you yeah. couldn't believe that there was those outstanding drum breaks that actually lived out there. You know, what were we thinking in the eighties? You know, oh my God, all this shit <laughs> lives like really lives and breathes from the late sixties, early seventies. Like, come yeah. on. So we were just kind of playing catch up again and learning again. It was all learning, man. I, I'm still fucking learning. Yeah. Um, and so, yeah, like working with J five was a, a wonderful learning experience. And, um, I'm very thankful for those guys for having me. And, um, yeah. Being a part of that and being able to stretch my mind creatively and say, okay, this part of the show, I'm going to pass the baton to you. You know, I like being that guy where yeah. we're going to have this big turntable and it opens up, you know, like I, I liked being <laughs> that guy because you can't do yeah. it by yourself. You just, a, a lot of the stuff I was doing with J5, you just can't do solo. Yeah. So it was, it, it led for a lot of dreaming and, uh, and explore exploration and yeah. Right. Right. Making the yeah, amazing dreams come true. So before let's let's jump back just a little bit. So yeah. you were already working on tons of beats and let let's kind of talk about how you got into producing your own music and what your first tools were. Did you jump in with an SP12 or what was how did you how did you first start making beats? Did you produce any other beats with other groups before J5? Let's talk a little right. bit about that and your process with creating beats. Yeah, so uh, my first drum machine was the Roland 606, little gray one. I think oh, it's the 606. Right, right, right. Is it the 626? No, I think it's the 606. Uh, little gray one. So that was my first one. And then I went to the Roland 707, which okay. in my opinion sounds like hot garbage, but I really was just looking for an 808. <laughs> you know, I was just looking for an 808. And I just, but I noticed that UTFO was using a lot of those sounds in yeah. their production. So I was like, oh, shit, that's the kick drum. That's the snare. That's the cowbell. So I was like, Okay, I'll mimic that thing, you know, show my friend, right. look, I did this UTFO beat. So I was mimicking just the drum patterns, but I didn't have any sampling gear, you know? Yeah. Um, and so then from the 707, I moved to the SP12, yeah. which had 2.5 seconds of sampling time on it and a Commodore disk drive, <laughs> floppy yeah. disk in it, which really challenged me because it's hard to, you know, make anything with that um, sample time. And then totally. from there, shit, from there, I went to an MPC 60. Uh huh. And then I paired that with uh, an Emacs 2, which had a shitload of sampling time. And I had a blast with that. It was fucking so, yeah, that was good. And then I left that <laughs> and did an SP 1200 standalone. Hmm. And then I did SP-1200 and S950, which is a classic New York setup, large professor, you know, yeah. digging in the crates, guys, you know, you know, Easy Mo B, that was their setup, you know. So I yeah. was hearing that that was their setup, and then I was hearing what the, how the MIDI mapping went, and so I would emulate that. I did that for a while, and then I left all that and um, went to an MPC-2000 because I had the sampling time. Everything was contained in one box. Right. And that was what the bulk of my production was through the records that people would know me from through yeah. Jurassic 5, really. Uh, yeah. And as far as groups before them, um, I was shopping stuff like through that guy, through, uh, Brother Soul I mentioned before. We were shopping. Right. Nothing was happening. Yeah. Um, not much else. There's another group I was a part of called Clockwork in junior in, in high school, but it was like just my original DJ crew and the MC that would run with us, this cat named Delight. Okay. Um, and, you know, we would get in battles and stuff like that, but he ultimately wasn't serious enough about MCing and broke my heart because <laughs> I really uh, wanted to learn. I wanted to learn with him. And, you know, I was like, yeah. we can shop a demo. Yeah. Um, 
So yeah, that was really not really much early, um, but yeah. during I, I started to it, right before J Five became serious. You know, when it was like that first single that I mentioned, what that cut made for the group. Right. I was working at a label called Correct Records, and I was exploring the business side. I wanted to learn the business side more. I needed to earn some money in my first apartment. I had I was broke. Yeah. And um, I was the college promotion guy slash A and R slash janitor slash anything you you can think of um, yeah. to earn a buck there. And so they were gracious enough to have me, and I signed this uh, cat named Grav out of okay. Chicago. I, well, yeah. he he played me some songs, and I was like, "This is dope." I played it for some people. I even played it for some of the guys in J Five. They liked it, hmm. and uh. He played me one song and I was like, yo, who produced that? And he was like, oh, this kid, Kanye. Mm. And I was like, so this is 1996, Dan. Dang. And so um, I was like, well, yo, if you finish the rest of the record with this kid, Kanye, we'll put out your whole album, you know? And so he yeah. did. So half of that album is produced by Kanye and that's Kanye's debut. Whoa, so, crazy. Yeah. So this is well before Dame Dash and Rockefeller and all that stuff or whatever. And right. um, I, I wanted to sign Kanye, but the label disbanded. Oh, so gotcha. I, I, I sometimes think about that. I'm like, oh, what, what kind of turn would his career would have taken if he was on correct before <laughs> anything else? Like, so it's right. good that he went to Rockefeller because it's a much bigger imprint. But wow. um, that was my first introduction into the music industry. Like, Okay, yeah. learning how to cold call DJs like, look, I really need you to add this record, you know, on college promotion, you know, put it at number one for this week, please, man. It's a good group, you know. I yeah. worked with another group called Manish. I, I did like one beat for them and per, oh, yeah, um, DJ that. for them on the road for a little bit, but it was like, it, it didn't really turn into much. Uh, J5 yeah. ended up taking over and uh, became very serious with the group. Yeah. Incredible. So, yeah, incredible, man. So when you guys first started, um, let, let's jump into J5. You were talking about just, uh, you know, the two groups, Unity Committee and Rebels of Rhythm coming together and kind of forming this this coalition. Yeah. And uh, talk about um, the Good Life Cafe, how you guys started, how, you, how your first uh, recordings came out. But I want to hear about those first days at Good Life and kind of your first times performing together and how, how you kind of honed what you did. Yeah. Okay. So I was probably the misfit in this conversation because I have only been in the Good Life probably three to five times. And it was with my previous crew, not with Jurassic Five. It was mm. with, you know, my boy G Down. Okay. Amani, and, and, and we would drive out there, but, you know, cars would break down and it was a long distance from the valley, you know, yeah. back then. Right. Right. So it was uh, I remember I saw uh, Mike and I take out like four MCs in the parking lot one night and I was like, holy shit, man, the, the buzz about fellowship is yeah the real deal. I had heard the demo or the circulating album um, to whom it may concern. Yeah. And was like, Yo, what's this five o'clock folly shit? This is insane. Like it, the whole thing was crazy. And so, that was okay. introduced to me through Brother Soul as well. So this okay. was still early. So I hadn't known J5 then. Yeah. Um, Cut was, as you've seen in interviews, he was like the only white dude in the building. He was, he represented. And I think him and him, Charlie and Mark, which were Unity Committee, did yeah. multiple performances from what I remember. Yeah. And I remember him getting, once I met Luke, I remember him saying, yeah, we're going to perform Thursday. We're going to do this thing. We got to, I have this thing on a cassette we're going to do. And I was like, wow, man, cool. Good shit. Like, um, how lucky you are to perform at Good Life. That's how I felt at the time. You know, yeah. I was very new to it and, um, yeah, wasn't really part of it. So, yeah, I would never put myself in that situation. I was just a fan of it. Yeah. I have utmost respect for the, you know, B Hall and Ava and, and, uh, everybody that was a part of it that kept it going. Um, right. Jay Smoove, all those dudes. Um, yeah, it was a very important time in LA and it really, yeah. really pushed the creative boundaries for, so many MCs, you know, not being able to curse, that's a, that's a fucking dope rule. I mean, it really pushes vocabulary. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. It, it sets things straight and you wouldn't think it, you know, you would think, oh, why, how stuffy. But no, look, no, don't curse. Can you, can you put, put yeah. together a cohesive rhyme or what? What's right. up, you know? Yeah. So, can you get around that? Yeah, it was um, a very special time. And it, it, again, it made me go, yep. It's okay to dream new. It's okay to explore. And, um, you know, that was shown through fellowships 
music at the time and that, that people were really trying to um, push the boundaries lyrically. Um, yeah, yeah, that's for sure. I can't remember the, f I'm sure Miles was the first one to play me Freestyle Fellowship, but yeah, that was, I still have that, the the first EP to whom I may concern and it still yeah. blows me away. Five O'Clock Follies. And yeah, yeah. <laughs> that first song with the guitar is fucking yeah. crazy. Yeah, um, yeah. They picked good beats. They had, they they had it set up properly. It was it was a proper demo. <laughs> Sunshine man, go four track. Yeah, boy, it's amazing what people could do on a four track. Hey man, but that just goes to show you with limits comes great creativity, right? You know. Yeah. Uh, all that early J five stuff was on an eight track, you know, at Cut's mom's house, you know, and so we were like, yeah. okay, we got to bounce this, we got to do this, we, you know, all that crazy shit he did with Lesson Six on eight track. I'm just like, man, this is like it's goes nuts. to show you that you know the mind is the most most powerful tool. Like we have so many tools now, and it's like I get overwhelmed with all the yeah. plugins. You know, I, I, yeah. I'm a plugin whore. I collect it all. Don't get me wrong, Dan, but Same. damn, like to think what we were doing with so much less. Yeah, I know. I started with, uh, you know, two 57s and an eight track cassette player, right. cassette, Ooh. you know, eight track cassette. Yeah. And, uh, you know, Sergeant Pepper was done on eight track. So it's like all kinds yeah. of crazy, sh you know, creativity is the most important part. Yeah, man. That is the for sure. Well, um, the first release was Unified Revolution on TVT Records uh, that was started by Steve Gottlieb. Talk about signing with TVT, what that deal looked like, and how the machinery worked that release. Like, what did they do yeah. to help promote it? Yeah. I don't know if they did. If but, they did. Well, <laughs> well I, you know, I actually, I didn't sign that deal because I was actually upset with the group and the deal. Like, you know, and I, and I they knew it. I voiced it. And yeah. they were like, well, fuck you then, new. <laughs> and they signed the deal. <laughs> and, but it was a single deal. Yeah. And I, I knew, and that was my gripe. It was like, no, nah, they should be taking us more seriously. And then yeah. working at Correct Records and working the Kanye Grav record out of Chicago, yeah. I caught wind that they were treating us as, a, they, 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 in one of the college notes hmm. from the label rep, they said that this is a novelty group. That's why they have a single deal. Uh -huh. So I we caught I told the group that I'm like come on man let's let's regroup everybody so while we re were requesting for them to drop us yeah. we were making the EP and by yeah. the time they finally dropped us and we were like thank you we appreciate it thank you guys you know because they had rights to the next single or some shit like that uh -huh. by the time they dropped us we had the EP ready to go locked and loaded for a nice indie release and and that's what propelled us to. Um, travel the world. Um, I was also going to x-ray school at that time. Okay. And I uh, was a few months away from graduating and dropped out much, much to my mom's uh, <laughs> anger. She was like, yeah. what the fuck are you doing? Yeah, yeah exactly. But uh, <laughs> it all took off all at the same time. Everything just it, it, right place, right time. And, you know, they say timing is one of the main components of this business, or I guess a lot of businesses, but really the music business. And um, I, I'm proud to say that I capitalized on saying fuck you to school because it was yeah. right for me. I'm not saying that to all the kiddies at home, no, but it was course. right for me. And it's all I could ever think about was music. It, it's my love, you know, and so yeah. it just all coincided at the right time. Well, you go to school to try and figure out your passion. And if you already have your passion, run with it. I wish you were my dad. <laughs> my dad would have probably actually, said what your dad said too but no 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 actually my dad was the realistic one it was my mom that was like no push to do x-ray you know so oh. i was in school to do x-ray you know my, my dad was like what the fuck are you doing man you're a drummer i saw you at the auditorium kick that guy's ass <laughs> my yeah. dad was and he, my dad was a speech teacher so he's you know and he wanted to be an actor at one point so i guess he he deep down really understood yeah. what i was after and what i could you know achieve if i put my mind to it you know but i was you know chasing yeah. the backup plan which could be dangerous you know yeah sometimes putting all your eggs in one basket is just like the way to go you know yeah i guess so it's crazy the drumming thing just to hop back to that for two seconds but i often you know with me trying to figure out how to be a better dj and learning it's like I don't know how I do it if I didn't have the music background. Cause it's like a lot of the times songs have that fill that's whatever, some little th three E and a four, and you know mm -hmm. what that timing is to lead into the next song. But right. like, if you didn't have that drumming background, how would you kind of, you know, how would you kind of navigate that? It would be crazy. Like 
I don't know how dudes who don't have the background in playing drums or instruments figure that out. It's mind blowing to me. It's incredible. It's just, you know, it's practice. I mean, yeah. Yeah. There's no, there's no, uh, there's no shortcut to any of this, man. It's like all practice and how many hours you put behind your craft, how many hours you spend digging for records, how many hours you spend trying to learn chords or, you know, like right now my whole thing is like, don't touch your records. Are you, Mm. are you that dope where you can't touch your records? And and I'm learning, you know, through doing sample packs with you. Thank you so much, Dan. And with, with uh, other musicians and learning how to just do my own chords and noodling as I'm trying to navigate that world, you know, real late in life, but I'm doing it. And it's like the next chapter for me. It's exciting for me because, you know, I've avoided it because I used records as a crutch slash my fun. (laughs) <laughs> well, yeah, it's it's fun. And, you know, I mean, I think your spirit and what you said earlier about just like, you know, I, I never stop learning. I think that's kind of the, the common thread with so many of us. It's like the minute you stop being a student, you're just you, it's over. You know, you got to keep learning and keep pushing yourself. Yeah, I mean, that's that's it for for. I mean, you know, I, I, that Bernard Purdy tape that, you know, went viral after the internet really hit, you know, it was on yeah. cassette, um, excuse me, it was on VHS before and I had it at my house hmm. and I would watch it all the time and he was laughing behind the drums and talking <laughs> shit and that, that those blue pants and the big red shirt, he looked like Fat Albert, you know, he's doing his shit <laughs> yeah. and like, I remember watching it and like, I was always, anybody that would come to my apartment, apartment at that time, this was when we were making quality control, by the way, with J5. Okay. Anybody that came to my apartment saw that video and they would end up laughing <laughs> while enjoying his fucking in ridiculous rhythms. Yeah. And uh, there's a part in there where he's talking about motivation. Yeah. And uh, when you when you have uh, right, he was getting at writer's block, but he didn't use that terminology. And he was like, you know, if you're not in the mood to play drums, just do rudiments, you know. And he's like, yeah. going pop, 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 you know, just just simple stuff and like so i took that to heart and i i i really listened to that part a lot because when you have a pressure of like you got to deliver to your first major label it's your debut yeah. album and you have that that pressure you know uh compressing you into your next <laughs> adventure yeah you want to be free you want to be childlike like i said before you want to be playful and if you have too much stress around you you're not paying the bills whatever it is yeah you're not going to deliver man the studio absorbs what's around you and what's in your head you know True. and how you're feeling it's a it's a spiritual moment with you behind the keyboard with you behind the drum machine with you in front of the mic turntables yeah. whatever it is guitar whatever you do yeah. so you got to be in the right mindset and so, so those rudiments and watching that bernard purdy tape changed me i remember playing it for b plus yeah and uh he, he was talking about ghost notes in that in that uh vhs and b plus went ding i'm gonna name it ghost notes you know so i'm glad (laughs) it fed more minds than just mine you know oh man yeah it's great shit absolutely well so let's take it uh that was a great tangent let's go check out um i want to talk about how was it easy to leave tvt records like you said they let you guys go they just decided it yeah. was cool to let you go out of the contract and we, then we you got formed lucky. your you got lucky yeah okay. yeah we got i mean i would say we got like they had the upper hand for sure like most labels do uh, and when you got, started rumble like how w- talk to me about the steps about how you guys formed your own label because you guys created that label to put out the ep well, yeah that, that was just simply a, a way to get the music heard so yeah. that was just like you know we needed a way we needed an imprint. Like I'm yeah. doing, I'm doing the same thing today with my label. I just yeah. want a way for people to hear my music. And so we knew yeah. that if we put that out and search for a P and D deal, yeah. Um, through God, fuck, I forgot the name of those guys. See, damn, I forgot the name of the first guys. Um, cool dude though. He put the record out, he did his job, but yeah. it was the UK that licensed the record. We, we, I kept uh-huh. hearing things about licensing back then. Like yeah. if, you know, I had a few people in my ear saying, you know, don't, sell the whole you know group to just one label that can do it worldwide you know put it out yeah locally locally we weren't getting love Mm. at that point we was starting a little talk here and there but like nobody wanted our demo when we shopped it Mm. um there was no labels knocking on our door at that time 
So when Pius played against Sam out of the UK, reached right. out, we did um, a license. So yeah. we were able to retain the rights, and that's when it took off. That's it was. Rumble was a conduit, but it it it, it didn't get us to the promised land. It was uh, uh, played against Sam and Carly Calf, who signed us or yeah. licensed us. Sure. Um, that you know when they put it out and they extended it to all their little branches, and then we start yeah. playing shows. It was just like, oh, here we fucking go. Yeah, but um, it it it, uh, it gave you something to license. So even though it, it gave didn't us take something off to license, here, yeah, yeah definitely. Smart. We needed we just needed something. We we could have called it nothing records, and it would still would have did something. I guess I don't know. <laughs> <Totally>. <laughs> but we 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 had fun during that era. It was very tricky to maneuver and get things out. And our, our whole thing was like even on the Unified record, uh, we were like, let's do shit like Fondalum in New York. Let's do indie records. You know, yeah. like, you know, Bob Ito was doing it. Like, how come we don't see a lot of this on the West Coast? We were seeing mm. it in the 80s, right? Like, with, uh, like, uh, 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 Mixed Master Spade and shit like that, right? Mm. Toddy T, those kind of records. But this era of the 90s was coming in and it became, I guess, cool to be indie. You know, white label, this and that, whatever. Yeah. But it, it was fueling the artist to be indie. And so we were like, oh, we can use that. We can use another gas tank. Sure, let's be indie. You know, let's make it look indie. Yeah. Um, and we were pretty indie with, with the exception of having a pressing and distribution deal. But, yeah. you know, we had no college staff pushing us with, besides me and Soup calling people around like, hey, you should really play our record and cut right. selling the records out of the back of his Honda Civic. So Right. <laughs> right. <laughs> Yeah, man, Shit. the hustle. The hustle is 24 hours a day back then. It's crazy. Well, it still yeah. is, even, you know, the more support you. But And so that was it. Did you guys have management or anything at that time? Or it was just you guys against the world at that time? Not really, no. Yeah. No, not really. I mean, it, it was a lot of talk about management and we flirted yeah. with it. But it was, no. It, by the time the EP was taken seriously, Dan became our manager, Dan Dalton. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but there was no, no one over us going like, okay, guys, you got to show on this date. Here's your calendar, you know, doing yeah. the preps for like what a, a manager, what we would think of today would do. Yeah. There was just us and us go, yo, I think we should play a show. Should we play Lamert Park? Oh, okay. You know, all this stuff like was happening really yeah. quickly at this time. Right. Wild. So talk about the steps that um, led up from that EP. You guys started performing. It kind of started, play it again, Sam, licensed it, and it started getting bigger overseas. Um, talk about how that led to Interscope sign, wanting to sign you guys and how the transition happened. Was, was uh, yeah, I guess there was no deal to buy out of. So you guys could, you guys were free and clear to sign a new deal. So yeah. How did, how did that happen? We started touring in the UK and like really took off, got a, you know, our plaques out there and everything, you know, like, but the US was still ignoring us, especially our backyard. LA wasn't really, they were, they knew we were doing well, but it wasn't yeah. until we really started saturating the market in the UK that our hometown started to embrace us. They're like, okay, mm -hmm. we should do a J5 show. It yeah. took a minute. It took a yeah. long time, actually. And, um, well, a long time for when you're in your twenties, there's yeah. a short time now when I think about it, but when you're in your twenties, <laughs> like, when is it ever going to happen? You know, <laughs> totally. <fuck. laughs> um, so we came back from the UK, you know, and it was like a deal from Columbia came in, a deal from Interscope came in, a deal from, I think Geffen and a few other labels, a bunch of deals came in and we said we'd had dinner with all of them. Yeah. And we, where we would tell them what we wanted over dinner and yeah. all of them ignored <laughs> certain choice portions of what we wanted over dinner, except for Interscope. They put their money where their mouth was mm. and they, it, it was reflected in the contract. Um, yeah. Not so much in the, in the sense of money, but in the sense of other little things that we needed. Okay. And so um, a lot of it had to do with freedom yeah. and um, getting masters back and all kinds of shit. So, mm. They, when you say getting masters back, what do you mean? Like you guys revert, own your masters? The, yeah, revert back After to us a at certain, certain time. time. Yeah. yeah. So mm -hmm. there, we, we had a great attorney at the time, Lisa Sokransky, who who cared about our brand. And yeah. um, I'm still thankful for her for her input and in, in doing what she did. Yeah. Because um, I, I read the contract now. I'm like, she cared. 
Right. Um, but the the thing about it was, um, I was in conflict of even signing with a major label at the time. I was still on the let's keep it indie Bobito kind of thing. Let's continue the brand mm-hmm. and let them sign us as a label instead of as a group. Right. The group the group didn't want to do that. The group was very much like well, actually, let me backtrack. At first, I didn't want to sign a deal at all. Let's just stay indie and sell it ourselves. Mm-hmm. And then Soup, thank God, said, "No, you're tripping. Yeah. We need a fucking music video. And as you remember at that time, Dan, how much were music videos at that time? Fucking 150 to 250K? Like, shit That's was a nuts. grip, right? Yeah. So when he said that, I was like, you checkmated me, Soup. And I was yeah. like, well, what if we do it as a label? And then... I wasn't really getting the feel from the group that they wanted to sign as a label. So we signed it as a group yeah. um, with the stipulations that I was talking about earlier. And yeah. we were able to do something fun with them. They never got in our way. Wow. Um, that's rare, they never man. had creative control over us. But the wow. one fucked up thing that happened is the guy that signed us left to, to Warner Brothers like oh. damn felt like a month after. I don't know. Dan Dalton will remember more than me, but it felt yeah. like a month to me. It was like almost immediately. So Tom yeah. Wally, who who left and went to Warner Brothers, yeah, he was the co-owner with Jimmy Iovine, yeah, bounced and went to Warner right after he signed Dang. us. So that's such we a common were, thing. Yeah, yeah. So we were the mes- misfits of that group, and Iovine was like, "I got Dre, Fifty, Eminem. What's this? Uh, Black Eyed Peas, who, who hadn't blown up yet? Right. Oh yeah, yeah. What's this J Five thing? What am I supposed to do that? But meanwhile, you know, we weren't getting radio play. But meanwhile, we would just have the lines wrapped around the block no matter where we played. So it was yeah. this weird, we were in this strange music industry nook, right? Where you're not on the radio. They don't know where to place you. They don't know if you're in black radio, K-Rock. Uh, they don't know where to place you, what to do. But they see, they're see they seeing numbers. Yeah. And they're seeing sales of the, of the album, uh, especially first mm-hmm. week. And they're seeing, you know, not through the roof or anything like that. I mean, we went gold, but it wasn't like fucking you know the groups at the time wasn't like 50 cent and eminem and and dre (laughs) so we were in a strange um uh predicament man i don't even know it would be a predicament i kind of liked it in way because it showed me very early at a young age as a kid that you can make it in this industry if you have a proper show Mm. and if you deliver music that speaks to people right um and it doesn't have to fit in a box right you know, that it taught me that what I was feeling since I was that 12 year old, 13 year old kid was yeah. true. You can, you can dream, you can explore, you don't have to cheat people and fucking, you know, uh, uh, um, sign a dude and not pay him and yeah. fucking all this shit. You don't have to do any of that shit. You just have to be true to yourself and fucking keep your chin up, chest out and fucking tell people who you are. This is what I do. You know, be true I'm proud to yourself of, and you I'm proud of the old fall. school. Yeah, I'm proud of the old school. I'm proud of the roots of this shit, you know? Yeah. Um, and just for me, I was like, all right, yeah, it would be great if we were on the radio, but all good. Yeah, but uh, talk about that because you brought up a good point. You know, I was hanging out with Will and those guys back then, and like their first three records didn't really do anywhere close to what Interscope was hoping for. Yeah. And, uh, well, I never thought that they were an underground group, though, either. Yeah, but but right. everybody disagrees with me, or, or at least I see things that were like, yeah, I remember when they were the original Black Eyed Peas, they do all the underground yeah. stuff. I'm like, I never heard it as underground music. I heard it yeah. as these guys had, hadn't really found their voice yet. That's yeah. I always heard that. And I wish yeah. I was closer with Will back yeah. then, because I would have been like, you're almost there. You should, you should. And, and he found it out by himself. He fucking, sure. he didn't need nobody, actually. He fucking just catapulted that shit into the next stratosphere and was like no fuck this we're making yeah. pop music that's gonna fuck your head up and yeah. and man <laughs> you know oh, absolutely it, they found absolutely. their they found their voice sometimes it takes a long time to find your voice and yeah. truthfully speaking dan like i didn't i don't feel like i found my voice as a producer until yeah. uh power numbers j5's mm. well third release yeah so it wasn't until i got my own studio my own monitors yeah. yeah, I was like, fuck this, you know, and was like, yeah. you know, quality control. I liked the record. I liked what I did on it. Mm-hmm. It's by no means my favorite J5 record. And I know that I was lost, mm. you know, <laughs> excuse the pun. How but, so? Uh, I, 
I wasn't, um, there were some cool things on there that I did, right? I, I liked what I did with monkey bars and I liked what dress yeah. finished first and a few things on there. Um, like I, I really liked, uh, swing set that I did with cut. Yeah. But I wasn't, um, started putting words. I, I hadn't found my inner voice yet. Yeah. I was exploring and having fun with the group. You know, I had the 13 year old part, but I hadn't <laughs> found, okay, but now what? I hadn't found the, but now what? I hadn't found the, but who are you? Hmm. You know, and it wasn't until I think power numbers that I was like, okay, this is who I am. Yeah. And that's, that's why what's golden was, was made in that album. And I was comfortable in my own s studio setting as well. Yeah. And I, I had always had a tough time going to bouncing from studio A to studio B to studio C and going, damn, is that a true representation to my snare? Mm. Like, I can't tell. I have no reference because I don't know his speakers. You yeah. know, it, it was it was a sonic thing. It was a feel thing. It was the pressure of delivering a record under um, a deadline. Yeah. Um, you know, of course, the, the normal shit competing with other music at the time. But, you know, I couldn't think that big because it drive me nuts. But yeah. Um, yeah. So it wasn't until that record. I was like, I'm at home. I bought my first crib. Yeah. Uh, I paid it off. Let's yeah. do it. You know, I was comfortable. I was, I didn't have that stress I talked about earlier. And I was like, well, if I brick, who gives a shit? You yeah. know, I was like, I'm, I'm comfortable when I'm making something. I know I've proven from the last two records that can stand up on their own. Yeah. Like, so yeah. Incredible. Incredible. So talk about, uh, you were talking about your attorney that helped you with the deal with Interscope. How did you find her? And, uh, sounds like, I mean, that's such an important thing for people who are dealing, you know, trying to get was, into this business. Yeah. I think Lisa was already working with Ozo Motley, if I'm not mistaken. And then, oh, okay. yeah, we got introduced to her and I think that's what happened. Yeah. Yeah. Friend, friendly recommendation. Recommendation mm -hmm. from friends is always the best. The importance to stay connected to your music friends. Can you talk to me about the importance of writing credits and publishing when you're making music? and yeah. how that's worked out and how you've worked that out in the past? Yeah, don't fuck with samples. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I couldn't Headline. resist. I couldn't resist, Dan. I know you appreciate yeah. it. You're a good musician, baby. Oh, man. <laughs> yeah, it's, uh, um, it's a lot of work. Well, you know, it's, it's, it's great to write your own music and to collaborate with other writers. And you sure. see that a lot right now with, with pop acts. Like, I mean, I, um, I'm recently working on a, a all covers record and I saw that one of the covers had like eight or nine writers on it. And I was like, damn, man, like, is that how these dudes are making hit records? Like, the, and so yeah. me and my best friend talk about it all the time. He's like, yo, there's like 10 or 12 writers on this fucking joint. And then, yeah. you know, then you make the argument, well, yeah, one's a rap and one's, I'm like, it's still a writer. Like everybody's a writer. So yeah. everyone's trying to get around the sample thing. Or yeah. there might be a sample included, and then you have even more writers. But to answer right. your question, you know, if, if, if you're musically inclined, you know, you should really take advantage of writing your own shit, spending time and collaborating with other people that could write melodies or harmonies that you can't. Um, don't be, never be afraid to split the pie with someone that you know can actually catapult you to another level in your music production or the specific song that you're working on. Right. Um, it's really key. Um, and I unfortunately learned that very late in life. I was very dependent on records. And it was just because we would spend so much time going around the world, digging in basements and flea markets, charity shops, as they call them in the UK, uh, yeah. <laughs> at, at flea markets, waking up at 4 a.m. You know, like we spent so much time in that world that it would have been a shame not to chop up release and uh rebirth what was happening from 68 to 74 in our digging experiences yeah so coming out of that it it, it just became even more powerful writing your own parts your own bass lines drum parts of course whatever that doesn't really count as writing but right it it's just um it it's a check that arrives all the time and they haven't stopped coming thank god yeah and um, your licensing capabilities, especially if you own the master, become much easier. Yeah. And, you know, right now I'm, I'm fully immersed in the motion picture and television industry. Just came off of doing, a, I don't know, 60% of the beat, 70% of the beats, I don't know, of, of Tom and Jerry that came out the animation. Oh, wow. Uh, helping out the um, 
Chris Leonard's who who did the score. Yeah. Um, and so like writing parts is important. You know, yeah. on that one, I only got one writers, but that's cool. I'll take one. Just I keep yeah. knocking on that door, like just let me in. But I did a lot of beats, and I'm learning how to navigate to when the director goes. This needs to sound. Um, uh, this needs to sound melancholy, you know, yeah. you get to think to yourself, okay, without using records, without using samples, without yeah. sampling off of YouTube, whatever you, you do at home when you're yeah. making beats, yeah. how do I make something sound melancholy yeah. or how do I make something sound exuberant? And so taking adjectives and translating them to a musical feel has been my new adventure yeah. and it's helped me in music production when I'm making my upcoming albums as, as well. I'm getting more comfortable with my plugins, getting right. more comfortable with, mu with musicians I bring in, uh, with you, Dan, when you come in. You know, all the people that I work with, I'm like, I know how to speak to them because I know where their strengths are now. Yeah. You know, so it's, it's, it's multifaceted. <laughs> yeah, no, that's a really interesting point because, you know, as me coming up on, on kind of the opposite end with learning instruments first is like, that's something you kind of quickly latch onto is like, how do I create something that sounds sad or how do I make something that sounds yeah. melan melancholy or yeah. tense or, you know, yeah. all these adjectives. Yeah. But it's like, that's, that's the key to it right there is kind of breaking down. Yeah. How, how did you figure it out? Did you just listen to records that had those aspects and then kind of figure out the chord, what the chord progressions were or the, what the melodies were doing? I have a lot of library records. Yeah. And uh, for those at home that don't, I, I don't know how savvy this audience is, but I, th for those who don't know what library records are, they, you know, there were records that weren't meant to be sold, but they were sent to motion picture houses and television houses. And like, you can right. use this, you can license this from us. And it's a part of music that's usually around a minute long or so, or a full song that has no right. lyrics on it that, and it has, you know, next to it, joyous. Right, right. <laughs> it's, it's to tell you the mood. Yeah. And so I refer to those again. I went back to those again. I even flirted Smart. with the idea of making a, a library record yeah. in this current state, but it's things are kind of different now. Everybody's uh, shopping things to music houses in different ways now. So I kind of abandoned that idea. Um, but that said, I would listen to those or go to YouTube. Um, like right now, I'm struggling with a cue for a podcast that I'm working on for um, uh, the food people uh, okay. for Bon Appetit. And I'm, yeah. I'm, struggling with curious so mm. like this needs to sound curious but it needs to be related to the theme that you've already delivered so i delivered a theme song yeah and so i'm like okay but my theme doesn't feel like curious mm. so it's like dual like it's knocking me in the chin twice right so right and curious to answer your question like how do i get to it it's like when you think curious you think oh hmm like yeah. you know yeah the, sw the swoop up sure so instruments do that you know right but my struggle with that particular cue is that curious very quickly be in my case kind of a uh, 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 um pi or detective e mm. and you don't want to go too dark so it's like a fine line between the curious and the you know dunk 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 right bling, you know <laughs> right peter sellers you know right. it could get very you know <laughs> right so exactly it you run into these thing you run into these things and you and you like this is how you learn. You keep falling on your face. And yeah. as I'm getting older, I don't mind getting the mud kicked in my face. I'm just like, ah, cool. I learned something today. Yep. Awesome. I'll That's... take the L. I'll get at it tomorrow morning. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. <laughs> get some sleep, get some fresh Shit. ears and try it yeah. again tomorrow. Absolutely. Okay, well, so how did you talk to me about um, your path into creating film music and TV music? Because you've done quite a bit of it. I was looking up at your credits yesterday and you did like The Green Zone with Matt Damon. You did stuff for Hollywood Homicide with Harrison Ford, Ride Along 2 with Ice Cube and Kevin Hart. Like you've done all kinds of cool stuff. Talk to me about how you first got into that and your adventures in it. I think my first one was through this cat that worked with um, Adam Sandler. He uh, uh, is a guy named Aaron Zygman, and he was doing a lot of the scoring back then. Yeah. And I, I imagine he's still doing it now. I haven't talked to Aaron in a long time. I need to find that dude. Yeah. But Aaron called me in for a scratch se session. He went, I, I need scratch scratches on this. And then I did some scratches at his house. Hmm. And I was like looking around. I'm like, saw how he's living. I'm like, damn, this dude is... He's living right. This is how I should be living. Yeah, right, <laughs> and right. you know the guys who score the the movies they, they they get laced, man. They're paid, you know, and and rightfully so. They have so much skill. They yeah. can work an orchestra. They can, you know, 
They know yep. theory like inside and out. And he was painting moods left and right. He was playing me a Brazilian cue that blew my fucking socks off. I mean, mm. if I ever see him again, I, and I even asked him, yo, dude, what would it take for me to sample this for my group? I yeah. really want this cue, you know, and it would just, it couldn't, we couldn't make it happen because it belonged to the motion picture, right? Uh. At any rate, um, I did some scratches for him. He was like, man, that is really cool, man. He's like, you're kind of approaching it from a producer standpoint. I'm like, well, I just figured that's what you want because it's for a motion picture. And he's like, hey, man, can you program something? And so I, I think I did one or two other things for him for a scene on the beach with this big woman, like this fat woman. And it's like a comedy scene. Yeah. I've always been into comedy, Dan. I guess I should be. I mean, I guess anybody who knows me knows that. They look at my Instagram. They'd be like, what the fuck is wrong with this guy? But uh, <laughs> I've you're always kind, been goofy Your like Instagram that. posts, <laughs> in, a, in, in addition to a couple other friends of mine, just keep me going, laughing all the time. Man. They're great. It's either that or coffee shit. Um, so... <laughs> Uh, what's it called? Uh, so I did that with him and then I, he referred me to Adam Sandler and yeah. then Adam had a comedy album. And so I did all the scratches on that and oh, then okay. some time lapsed and I started working with, um, this guy, Todd Bozung, who recently passed away. Uh, that's mm. my brother. I, I miss him so much. He, he, he brought me into the fold because he, well, he kind of cold called me and said, Hey man, I, I, I I've listened to all your shit and like uh, out of all the drastic stuff, I'm really gravitating towards your beats. Can yeah. I bring you in on this project? I have a friend who has a project. So I work with a music supervisor named spring Aspers at screen gems, hmm. did a mix for her. It did some light production work. And then I work with Todd again on ride along one, ride along two. And it just so happened on ride along one or ride along two with Kevin Hart and ice cube. It's, it was the same guy scoring it. Christopher Leonard's and the same crew of people. So I learned how to talk. I learned how to deliver my cues, yeah. learned how to help out. And at that point, I was just tracing what they're doing. You know, like they they have a scene and he has like maybe orchestral parts in place, but it's an alley fight. You know, I need to sound rugged and urban. And so they give it to me and I texturize the shit out of it. And sure, would sure. Do maybe add a bass line, add different drums, of course, you know, take, take out the... Or orchestration input something else you know um right cuts and scratches of course um so yeah i mean that's and i've just been knocking on this door for the last 10 12 years and they're spoon feeding me little things and yeah. this is all in hopes for me to you know score something one day myself because um i got a lot of ideas in score world and i'm, I'm, I'm do, achieving man. feel right now i'm a learning feel right yeah, I just uh, I just had it was, it was the most beautiful realization. But I just heard uh, I listen to Mark Maron's podcast all the time, and he just had uh, Danny Elfman on, oh, and man. he was talking about Danny and how just his relationship with Tim Burton came about. And he <sighs> Tim was a big Oingo Boingo fan, and so oh, man, uh, I'll, you know, listen to the podcast for the full story. But basically, he was he he did Pee-wee's Big Adventure got a lot of acclaim that was t that was Danny's first movie and right. uh has since done like 17 movies with Tim but he would do like four in between and after a while Tim was like you know why do you keep uh doing all these movies am I not taking care of you well enough or whatever he's like right. I'm trying to figure out how to do this man like I don't know That's how right. to do this so so I have the, man this is really beautiful to hear Dan honestly cuz like this is the podcast that I mentioned a little while back it's like yeah. very low budget and yeah. I, i'm taking it because i want to learn yeah but it's getting in the way of my other the world's opening up now and like you know i got a wu-tang and fucking big boy show coming up in denver i got this oh. thing with tristan eaton coming up i got yeah. a lot of you know people are like hey do you want to dj again i'm like yes please <laughs> yeah. get me the fuck out of the house like yeah right you know, uh, so I'm, it's good to know that i have a similar philosophy uh, to my hero, Danny Elfman, because oh, that's, um, I think the, the more times you throw at the target, at the very least, you're going to learn something new, you know? Absolutely. And that's where I'm at right now. I just want to, I want to get to another level in my production. I want to enjoy this uh, yeah. as an old man. I want to be able to walk on stage with a cane and still play 45. Seriously. Like, I mean, right. I look at my career like BB King, you know, yeah. dragging Lucille on, on stage <laughs> <laughs> and just still murdering shit. Like that's how, totally. I mean, I'm in it for the gusto, you know, as, as Ray Kwan said, you know? Yeah, man. So, I mean, yeah, it's really cool to hear that, Dan. That was the coolest thing I've heard all week, bro. 
he that podcast it just blew me away i was i took my son to the skate park with his buddies and i was just sitting in the car uh and listening to it and it was just like damn it was the best interview i love mark's interviews but um yeah this one with danny was just like holy smokes it was just beautiful yeah you'll enjoy it man take a minute and listen hey, man, to it. and you know what's crazy about that is i heard he doesn't even do interviews i know i this i never see anything with him so i was like Danny, he's got danny elfman on holy shit i gotta listen so, to this man i, I want to know what that bribe looked like i don't know man <laughs> but it was like that's a joke everybody <laughs> <laughs> danny used to live in topanga i used to deliver pizza to him but i never got uh, to you know super wow. chat with him so it was cool to listen to him talk man because yeah. he's just such a smart dude and... hey man the simpsons alone that score is redonkulous dude like i know i know sounds like a roller coaster the whole fucking thing i know well so um who ha, talk to me about since you've gotten into all this? Are you in like who's who's hustling your sinks for you? Who's getting your stuff in? You don't have to mention names if you don't want to, but how are you going about getting your music placed in TV, film, and gaming and all that? What's your strategy um, with all that? Well, because I've spent so much time talking to supervisors and music editors. Yeah. Um, I'm doing it myself at the moment. Right. Uh, well, no, I should say I have been doing it by myself up until this point and I've, yeah. thank God have had some cool placements, but, um, recently I just signed my digital, um, digital rights to a company called Symphonic and they're okay. going to take over and there's a, they have a subdivision called Bodega that does, uh, hmm. Licensing or, or does you know does the shopping for you? So I'm doing a year deal. I'm I'm not doing anything more than a year at at, at my age. I'm like, gotcha. How do you, sh show me something in a year, right? Right. <laughs> I think it's enough time, right, Dan? And I think so, that's how it goes. Yeah. You know, with yeah. most of these people who are trying to hustle sinks for you, is you give them a yeah. one year and see what they do. Yeah, you know? and they're good dudes, and they're you know so far so good. So they they'll be putting out my upcoming release called Run for Cover, which is an all covers record. Oh, sick. And um. Yeah. And so I've given a bunch of songs a license that are sample free or, you know, cleared or whatever. And like, uh, right. do what it does. One stop um, shop. But I always talk to, to supervisors and I always, you know, at the very least go, hey, you know, you should check out, you know, it's not always about me. That's the other thing. Like I, sure. like even on my social media, like if, if you say, hey, new, I have a new release and, and we're buddies and I know it's good shit, I put it on my story. So like yeah. when I talk to supervisors, I'm like, you should really check out this producer, this kid theory has it. He's yeah. dope. You should like, I talk to them about people so they know I'm not just, Hey, look at me, 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 me. I'm on my own dick the whole time. Like that, right, that right. only goes so far. Right. And sure. And, and look, honestly speaking, there's times where I'm so busy, maybe working on a queue or working on a podcast or something that I don't have anything fresh, ready to go for them, but right. I still keep the relationship. And, and honestly, these dudes I like talking to, like, I love talking to my friend, Angela Lewis, you know, like yeah. I like, I like, you know, being in contact with them, you know, sure, I, sure. they're, they're fun people to talk to. And, you know, I always trip out on music supervisors and editors. I'm like, you guys are DJs for movies. This is so fucking dope. Like, I know, I know. what kind of dream job? Like my boy Todd that passed. I'm like, dude, you're a DJ for a movie, man. Like or for yeah. movies and you're independent. You're a fucking G man. Like how, yeah. how lucky, you know? And he, he would always laugh. He's like, no way, man, you got the rock style life. I'm like, nah, man, uh, <laughs> this is what you're doing is, is, is cool. Well, the so, thing you know, you, we all have in common is just like that's that um, incredible feeling when we hear a record that just blows our mind is sharing yeah. it with other people, man, whether it's yeah. ours, hopefully, you know, or That'll never go it's away. someone else's, you know, it never yeah. goes away. Thank God. That'll never go away. And and there's and there's a lot of good music right now. So it's like, fuck, yeah. it's it's con this keeps happening. So when, when I see people saying there's no good shit, I'm like, man, you're not you're not looking because there's some right. insane shit right now. And it's yeah. like, you know, it's. it's to the detriment of maybe less promotion or so many things being flooded in the music space, but that's, that's good true. shit. If you keep your ears open, you can find it. That's for sure. That's right. I was just talking to Jack and Miles Brown and they brought up theory has it too. Cause he did some beats on Miles's record, which is oh, pretty cool. cool. Did he like, really? Yeah. Damn. Yeah. I oh, think shit. that's right. Oh, maybe he did it on Jack's record. They both miles mm -hmm. put out a record and Jack has a record coming out. Maybe it was Jack's new record. I can't remember, but uh huh. anyway, yeah. So someone to look out for, for sure. That's the second yeah. time his name's come up. Well, so um, we don't have too much time here left, but um, I don't want to keep you forever. But I, want to I wanted to talk about um, your Zodiac Track series and um, 
Man, it's just so impressive on so many levels. Um, how do you prepare for each episode? How much time goes into researching to make these things, these sets cohesive, not only with regards to the artists and the signs of people and their birthdays, but re with regards to making it music musically cohesive at the same time? Yeah, it's it's tough to answer that. And that's the most asked question I get for concerning Zodiac tracks. Um, okay. But... I'll try to, I'll try my best. So like getting the signs together is a whole mission in itself. So, yeah. you know, scouring the net or looking through your record collection, like, oh, you know, I should really represent exhibit, you know, because he's, he, he, he made some key songs and did a change in nineties, whatever, you know, and, you know, yeah. certain things sit with you, important artists or um, artists that would make for good segues into the next artist. So there was a good portion of my time before I even started the mixes, just gathering birthdays. Yeah. And I think the hardest part about that <laughs> partition of Zodiac tracks was the misinformation on the net. Mm -hmm. So like I, I, to this day, I think there's two birthdays for MF doom. I don't know if that's true. Yeah. Um, there's, you know, there's people that have two different birthdays. There's people that are very secretive about their birthdays. There's, <laughs> right. you know, um, well, what's it called? Uh, um, uh, I forget the name of the website, damn. But but there's sites that have information that are that are incorrect. Yeah. And so double checking my work was a trip. Um, <laughs> so there's that portion. Um, I don't know how to put that into time for you, Dan. But I know no, that I a... spent some. I, I know I spent at least you know a week looking around for birthdays. You know, yeah. uh, in my leisurely time when I was like, well, I, I need to do something constant, and I need to do something that is opposite of celebrating when people die, which I'm not into. Yeah, um, I wanted to celebrate people's birth right. and what they're about while they're here. <laughs> right. And so, yeah, there's that. Okay, so then, but then the prep of the mix. Yeah. My my biggest pitfall with that was not having the hip hop record. I'm ashamed to say that. So like I in my head would think, okay, I have React by you know um, Eric Sermon, mm. you know, um, but. I didn't have the 12 inch. I had it in Serato, you know, mm. cause it was one of those records as right when Serato came into place. So I yeah. would, you know, do the flurry on Discogs or go to Amiibo or go whatever I could to find the hip hop record. But I would have like the original samples. I had all the original samples, but I didn't have the hip hop the records that I was yeah. trying to celebrate. Right. And the whole point of Zodiac tracks is to like get in as many birthdays as possible for that specific month. So if sure. I'm in Gemini and it's like ice cube, Kanye, you know, Lauren Hill, myself, whatever, you know, these are all Gemini's. And yeah. so the whole point is to get as many in as you can, you know? Yeah. Um, and I try my best to find who they sampled and weave that in. And especially if they're the same sign, yeah. that's when it's like, I'm like, yeah, the fucking guy that he sampled <laughs> is the same sign as him. How gangster is that? I, I did one in Scorpio that was so fucking ill. It was like both MCs were the same sign. And then the guy that they sampled was the same sign. And I was like, fuck yeah, that was a fucking three for one, baby. So, <laughs> you know, my, my whole shit is to celebrate birthdays, right? Is to yeah. celebrate as many Zodiacs, you know, yeah. tracks as, as I can. So um, the actual, to get to your question, the, the actual rehearsing for the performance was, it's always a day, just like yeah. one day of me going through it. And then, and it always takes me between one in five takes to actually execute it in one cohesive take where there's no break in the camera. Yeah. Um, and my man, Pablo Aguilar can attest to that. He was here filming it <laughs> like, okay, do it again. But I miss, I, I didn't get that part or you fucked up on this part or whatever. So, um, yeah. so the performance part wasn't hard. It's just like not having the records was to answer your question. The, gotcha. the hardest part about it, like not having like, Oh, if I just had this, so and so hip hop record. If I just had, you know, uh, fucking Snoop's first LP, you know, whatever, yeah. you know. Right. Yeah. That well, I mean, coming from someone me that's, you know, trying to up my game as a DJ and just trying to get my basic shit together, the fact that you're getting those performances in one to five takes is a huge uh, attest to you, uh, your talents. It's incredible, man. Incredible. Uh, it means a lot coming from you, Dan. Thank you. Oh, it's true, man. It's it's, it's incredible. Um, well, uh, your hustle is noteworthy in so many facets, man. And I wanted to talk to you about 
just personally with your branding and your merchandising and social media? Do you have someone that helps you with that? Do you have a business manager that strategizes and figures out the best ways to kind of push your brands forward? No. No, doing it all yourself. <laughs> Incredible. <laughs> That's even another, more impressive, man. Another no, Dan, another no. Well, I had a manager for a while. Do you ever and, sleep, you know, Mark? That's the, that's the other question. I sleep a lot. And actually, <laughs> I mean, I, I mean, I'm one of these people that like, you know, I, I think I'm at the, at the, at the stage where I only walk into my studio when I have something to say now. Like yeah. I, I don't get me wrong. I come in here and I play. I have to touch and feel it, even though I'm not putting it out. Whatever it is, you'll never see the light of day. Of probably ninety percent of my beats. Yeah. But when I'm when I'm serious, I'm like, oh shit, I got an idea. I come in here and do it. And and sometimes it makes it, sometimes it doesn't. Yeah. So I think that's how I'm different from I was in my twenties when I would make myself. You know, the quality control record that I was talking about. I was yeah. making myself do it, and I would make myself go to someone else's studio, and it was like. You have to do it because you have the contract and you are a musician new, right. you know, you should be at the level of cut or shadow or yada, yada, yada black eyed peas, whatever's happening around, uh, you know, yeah. all the noise. Yeah. And now I'm in a stage where I have my own label. I can put it out if I want. And I just, I, I feel not to sound like a fucking cheese dick, but I feel like I've already said what I had to say and, mm. and I proved myself in a sense. Yeah. Uh, and now, so I just, I just want to put out dope shit now. Like I, if yeah, it won't leave my studio unless I go to myself. Okay. If that bricks new, you have no reason to be pissed because you did your best. That's how right. I, I'm looking at it now. Where in the past I was just like, I had to meet this deadline. Fuck. You mm -hmm. know, I'm working for somebody else basically. Right. Right, right, um, right. yeah, I don't know if that answered your question, but I mean, no, that does. Yeah. That's a, that's a, that's a good place to be, man. Only come in when inspiration hits and, uh, yeah. just, that that's something I think a lot of people don't talk about is just, you know, you you think of people like Bob Dylan and just any creative people. How much how how important it is to just get stuff out when you're feeling it. You know, like Man. people get so <laughs> caught up in like I don't know if this is good enough to record. I don't you know blah blah blah. Yeah. It's like just go out there and lay it down, and you know if you don't end up using it, don't use it. But like. Yeah. When you're feeling any idea, get out there and record it, you know? Yeah, I know I just said that I, I 80% of my shit doesn't come out, but I've been trying very hard to do what you what you just said it, because one of my boys was just saying, well, it's not about what you think. It's about like how they perceive your shit. And I was right. just like, at first I was like, ah, you know, but I was like, no, don't tell me, you know? And then I was like, huh, that's interesting, you know? I, and I think that's like Mad Lib's approach. You know, he yeah. keeps throwing at the target, you sure. know? A lot of those beat tapes he did weren't even beats. They were just records yep. as right. interludes, you know, <laughs> right, and right. right. I mean, yep. and, and, and look, that's not a knock. That, that's my, that's my boy, you know, yep. and, and he, he's done it. He did it. And Amazing. he's like, well, forever be legendary because he keeps throwing at the fucking target. Yeah. You know, the, the days of putting out a record and being, uh, having the mystique and disappearing for three years, that shit is dead. Yeah. Um, you got to kind of stay in people's faces. I'm talking, I guess for the, uh, f from the standpoint of um, not success, but the standpoint of, of, I guess, relevance, staying around, people well, caring, yeah. you know, yeah, people I mean, giving it, a shit, you know. Like, it you seems know, like it, it's all about just like, I mean, these days it's more about the lifestyle. And I don't mean lifestyle like look at my bling and everything, but yeah, uh, it's, it's more about just like, you're right, there's so much music and content constantly coming at people on social media, which is how most people find out about stuff that yeah. it's like you, you do, you have to stay in people's faces and just be like, look, I'm still out here just doing shit. Great shit all the time, you know? Right. And, and that's kind of another reason, or that was kind of one of the reasons why Zodiac tracks was born to just kind of circle back is it's yeah. like, well, I want to do, I don't really do much DJ shit online. I, you know, I do a few mm. posts here from the shows I played, but it's, right. it always felt very much like, look at me, look at me. Um, like, like look yeah. where I was at. It felt like, you know, right. and I, I'm a different person now. Yeah. Like in my twenties, it's cool to say, yo, I just got back from Rome. I just got, you know, but now I'm in a place where I like, you know, I kind of want to start giving back <laughs> yeah. and celebrate the birthdays, you know, y while showing what I do for a living, you know, and showing the, the history I have with music and the kind of shit I collect and mm -hmm. the kind of shit I just discovered. Yeah. Um, so yeah, there's that. And, and I guess that kind of brought me into the Method Man thing. 
uh, because I wanted him to help me celebrate the end of it. <laughs> you know, like, yeah. oh, I, ce- I celebrated you on the first series, so please help me celebrate the end of it. <laughs> and man, it came up, it, it came out so incredible, man. I'm so incredibly proud to be part of that single, man. Wow. Thanks to you, Dan. Fuck. I mean, <laughs> uh, for those that don't know, uh, I had an, a musical idea and Dan executed damn near every instrument on that joint. <laughs> And uh, with the help of my man, Money Mark, yeah. and uh, for those who don't know what the fuck I'm talking about, we did a song called Zodiac Killer yes. featuring Method Man. And my man, Dan, got busy on guitar, bass, tambourine. I got to be on a track um, with you, Meth, yeah. and Money Mark. Like, Money I, Mark, you know, yeah. I'm happy, Money man. Mark on keys, yeah. <laughs> That's yeah. Like crazy. And I knew you were the guy to call, and it, it just made sense, man. And, and it, I, you and I have been talking about working together for the longest of time <laughs> it's been way I'm too so, long and, and we finally made it happen it made sense and um so i'm just happy to be a part of it out. with you dude dude people love that single too right still on. people always yeah. asking me about that well with our last couple minutes here i just it's a fun way to end it but um let's talk about your favorite producers that are your guiding lights in terms of talents ears business savvy who do you look to who are kind of your uh your guiding lights in that respect? Um, well, I'd have to start with Quincy Jones. Yeah. Um, I can't even like just saying his name. I get goosebumps because I just, <laughs> I just get a bunch of like r- records that come into my brain when I say Quincy, you know, yeah. just summer in the city alone. I listen to it. I'm just like, God damn, man. Like it, I was talking to cut about it yesterday, actually. Yeah. And, and he was like, he's, he says something like it brings you to different scenes. It brings you to different worlds or something like that. And I'm like, yeah, that's what I'm feeling, but I didn't know how to express it the way you did. And I think that's what it is. And and the thing I like about it, which I'm not very good at that I'm working very hard on uh, with motion picture and television and and my upcoming album is, is the, uh, the impending event. That's what my dad used to call it, which Hmm. is, it's a speech technique. Whereas you go like, what I'm about to tell you is, going to blow your mind the thing Mm. i'm about to tell you is so cool it'll revolutionize the way you think yeah when i tell you what i'm about to tell you and you're like well what the fuck is it you know (laughs) and so that was my dad's thing as a speech professor and i think quincy does that in that specific song it's summer in the city it's like well where are we going fucking next man like and he takes his time with it that's the key it's it's a slow tempo everything's breathing yeah. Fucking Quincy, man. Fucking Quincy. Yeah. He it's just, just endless. He's he just... a master of moods, man. I mean, like <sighs> from that to like something like The Lost Man, that Brazilian soundtrack he did. And then there's like Snow Creatures and like it, there's it just never so ends. it's never ending. There's record it, it, after record. It's crazy. And there's certain producers you know, like, and not to be fucking Debbie Downer, but you know you'll never be that good. Like, you yeah. know, and I wouldn't even put myself <laughs> in the same category. You so but look, there's a sense of uh, um, um, relief yeah. by knowing that. There's a yeah. sense of like, man, I can just get lost in this and not have to study it. I don't want to study it. Yeah. I just want to fucking bask in it. I want to vacuum to this shit. You know, I, know. I want yeah. to vacuum my fucking studio floor to this. You know, <laughs> totally. and just feel and feel something. I don't want to fucking analyze. And I'm doing yeah. a new thing on my IG where I'm just like, just thinking. I mean, I mean, not thinking, just listening or whatever. When I play a record that I'm like, I'll never be able to do this. This is just like insanity like straight one shot to the fucking heart but yeah well anyway that was the scenic route sorry um quincy's mm-hmm. one you know for business savvy and of course sound dre um but like my heart and soul is like with like ditc mm-hmm. you know all those producers you know fucking lord finesse and uh, diamond my man d. diamond d and you know, all those dudes were just they were bringing into fruition what i was doing on the road which was digging like crazy yeah. and they were making it a a, a reality yeah. um i love high tech um I, uh, jay dillo is probably my favorite of all time in hip-hop i mean yeah. there's this there's you know he's one of those guys that like <laughs> just makes you shake your fucking head like it's like <laughs> i got to a point in my production dan where i was like damn i got fucking good drums like I'm, I'm programming good drums and then you hear his shit and you're like what in the fuck just happened <laughs> yeah like what <laughs> happened and it, the, this whole approach i mean it's been said probably a million times but i'll just say it the way i, I know how to say it and i think you revolutionize pocket and spacing mm. you know you you the first snare is late creating yeah. a pocket 
creating a pocket from the first kick to the first snare. So you have more room to EQ now. Yeah. <laughs> eh, fucking nuts. And then yeah. the next snare comes early. So it throws your timing off. So now your head wants to move with it. It's just, ah, fuck. I know. <laughs> I know. It's <laughs> Insanity. Wild. And then we're not even talking about the ridiculous melodies and the, and the great records that he selected or uh, that yeah. he flipped, I'll say. Um, his drum programming, his EQing, his outboard gear, you can tell shit's popping. He knows how to compress. Yeah. He, he has, there's just too many damn things to list on Dilla. So yeah, I think those are, <laughs> those are good three. Quincy, are... Dre, and Dilla shit. I, don't know. I mean, I love Timbaland though, by the way. I mean, because okay. I, I, I love the, um, capability of bringing in ethnic sounds and mm -hmm. uh flipping those and he, he does that proper you know yeah. um i love that he brought in middle eastern and, and indian influences that's that's my kind of shit i mean it's it, he, he did it in a pop sense come on man that's I that's know. that's hustle that's real hustle absolutely it is absolutely it is man wow um all right last question who would you love Ooh. to work with that you haven't worked with yet no mm. um I need to work with, with De La Soul mm -hmm. and, and, and not, there's a lot of overlaps and there's a lot of things I know I could contribute. It's not so much from my standpoint, like a notch on my belt. Yeah. It's more for, from the standpoint of like, I know what I can contribute. Yeah. And, um, I love those guys. Like, I mean, I, I love them as people. Yeah, they're good people. Uh, I mean, I love their music. Don't get me wrong. I mean, of course, I love their music. I mean, who doesn't? Shit. But I know there would be something very um, explosive in the studio popping off the way I think. And, and, I, and I think there's a, there would be a tremendous amount of growth. I, I know I would walk away learning from some crazy shit. I like that they always were like, you know, okay, we're going to do this part here. Then that's going to jump over there. And then there's going to be something very strange that happens. And then, you know, I like this, <laughs> yeah. I like this thing of like unexpected left turns. I'm, I'm into that shit. And, right. um, yeah, uh, Feral Munch, I, 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 it has to happen. I work with him indirectly through this group called Hilltop Hoods, who are like one of the illest out of Australia. They, they're huge. Hmm. But I guess they shot. I gotta check that I, out. They 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 told they they called me mad one day because they said they shopped Pharaoh something like twenty some beats and then I gave him two beats and they he picked mine. Ooh, <laughs> so it was a collaboration. Sick. It was a collaboration with Hilltop Hoods and Feral Munch and I ended sick. up produce, producing it. But Ooh, I still I don't feel like I've that. worked. Yeah, I feel like uh, it, uh, fuck. What's the name of that shit? Classic example is the name of the song by Hilltop right. Hoods. Oh man, what um, a great name for a group too, Hilltop Hoods. That's killer. Yeah, but I feel like I need to work with Farrell directly. There's a lot I can. Yeah, I think we would get lost in the studio, and and I and I know I can hear already hear it. I can already hear what it what it has to happen. I'm a huge. <laughs> he's Farrell's like in my top three. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Man. I'd I'd like to. I don't know. Is that a? There's someone else I'd like to work with. I, you know, honestly, I I want to whack at working with uh with Jay Z. Yeah. I know. I know something great could come out of it, but I mean, you know, it's Jay Z. So you know. Hey man. But yeah, these are the words that we manifest. My mind. Yeah, yeah. We gotta, these are man, the words that I manifest. We got to yeah. manifest them, man. If we put them out there, you <laughs> never know, man. But I That's would right. love to hear records with you and all of those people. But uh, man, you, Poss, Dave, and Maceo, that would be crazy, crazy. Yeah. Holy I, I think smokes. their new album is with um, the new album they're doing with Pete Rock and um, in Premiere. Yeah. So right. that's fucking right. going to be insanity. So I we know. have something very nice to look to. Totally. Look forward to. Totally. Well, Newmark, thank you so much for taking the time out of your day to do this with me, man. I so appreciate you. My brother. And, uh, it's an honor to talk to someone as gifted as you and someone that's like that clued in to funk, soul, hip hop, and knows his instruments so well and has an appreciation for DJs. I mean, it's a, very few minds are, are like yours, my friend. It's, it's, it's refreshing to talk to someone with an open mind like yours. Oh, thank you, man. Thank you. Thank you. I'm constantly trying to learn. That's it. Same as you. Yes, sir. Well, thank you. I love you, brother. And uh, thanks once again. Coming on more, the brother. conduit. All right, man. All right. Hope you enjoyed this episode of The Conduit. The 
Conduit is brought to you by Crew S Studio and DanUbeProductions.com. Many thanks to the folks at Squadcast, Polymash, Captivate, We Edit Podcasts, Universal Audio, Audio Technica, Sure, and Avid. I'd like to dedicate this episode of The Conduit to DJ Newmark's friend, Todd Bozon, music supervisor extraordinaire. Extra special thanks to my brothers from other mothers, Scott Power, Bill Coulter, and Alex Dezer. And last but not least, go check out Soul Picnic, my hand-picked music playlists on notrealart.com. Until next time, this is Dan Ubik, signing off.